Welcome everyone to Past and Present with Allison Gilbert and her guests. My name is Andrew Engel and I am Senior Programmer at Reimagine. Our mission is to help people of all backgrounds to face adversity, loss, and mortality and channel the hard parts of life into meaningful action and growth. I'd like to thank For Grief for their support of this series, especially Christina Sirio. And before we begin, I wanna offer just a few Zoom tips, actually only one Zoom tip. Uh, you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, the CC button, that is a live transcription. And for those who need it, you can activate that. Um, thank you. The um, majority of us are Zooming in from the United States, also known as Tur Turtle Island by Native Americans and their allies. Uh, Allison and I are in Lenape Hoking, the area that covers the New York metro area. Please tell us where you are. And if you're curious about the indigenous territory where you're located, you can uh, check it out at native-land.ca. Um, and I want you all to mark your calendars for the next Past and Present with Allison. Her guests will be writers Tembi Locke and Jenny Lisk. The topic is widowhood. And both guests have written compelling memoirs about losing a spouse, and it's on June 30th. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce Allison. Allison Gilbert is the author of numerous books, including the forthcoming biography of Hearst newspaper columnist, Elsie Robinson, to be published by Basic Books Hatchet in September. Her most recent book, Past and Present, Keeping Memories of Loved Ones Alive, reveals creative ways to remember family and friends we never want to forget. You can follow Allison on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Christina will, Christina will be posting uh, the handles in the chat. Um, and she's everywhere as a Gilbert writer. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Allison Gilbert. Hey, everybody. It is my favorite time of the month, which is the last Thursday, because I get to come back and be with you in community. It feels even more meaningful to me today for a bunch of reasons. One is that we are joined by Catherine Tuggle and Jean Chatsky, who have written together with the entire Her Money team, this incredible book called How to Money. I love it. I was honored to be at their book launch in New York City, uh, a very exciting event at Barnes and Noble, huge crowd, people were clamoring for their book. We will talk about it, but let me first say hello to Jean Chatsky and Catherine Tuggle. So just say hello real quick and then I'll do a proper introduction. Hey everybody, good to be with you guys. Hi, thank you guys so much for being here. We're so excited. So in my social media posts in the last few hours, I admitted that I was unsure if we should be actually offering this event today. It felt a little bit um, nerve wracking to me given the events that we have all um, seen and witnessed and heard about unfolding in Texas. So what I would like to do and what I promised to do, which I would feel very comforted by myself, is to just take a few seconds together in community to pause. I will not take very long, I promise, because I know you all wanna hear from our guests but it just feels appropriate to just pause for a beat because I know we are all so busy and we're carving out this time to be together. So if we can just close our eyes or look out the window and just be together and feel each other's presence just for a moment and think about those people, those children of course, and teachers who have lost their lives in Texas.
Thank you guys so much. I appreciate that. I know I needed to not just keep being busy, which I find to be uh, very easy for me to do is to consume my days with work. So thank you for um, just pausing just for a moment. In Andy's introduction, you also probably heard something a little bit different if you are a habitual joiner of these past and present conversations. You will have no doubt noticed that Domani for Grief is now for grief. The branding transition is underway. It is happening. All the channels have been changed and updated. The website is morphing and transitioning. Uh, there'll be new and exciting things being added to the For Grief platform as we move forward. But I wanted to at least acknowledge the fact that I might have heard and sounded a little bit differently to you um, this, this, this week, this month. So let's start with this incredible book. I love it. And by the way, my son just graduated college. And I think, I think it's a great graduation gift, whether or not your child, your niece, your nephew, your grandchild is graduating high school or college. I think it is a fantastic gift. So Jean, I of course want to start with you, if you don't mind, Catherine, how did you decide to come up with this book? How did you and Catherine together decide to come up with this book? You have written many books before, but this audience is very particular. It's not for the adult reader. Help us understand what this book is all about. Sure, this book is the book that we really wish we had when we were coming out of high school or particularly for me coming out of college. Um, I, I think, thanks to the pandemic and if if there has been any sort of a silver lining to the pandemic one one sliver of it is that um, we're, we're having a more serious conversation about the need for financial education than we have had before in this country we, we're seeing more states mandate financial literacy education more states say that it has to be something that you go through before you can actually graduate and that's fantastic news but right now most of the adults in this country don't come out of college or high school equipped to um to manage the basic uh things we have to do every single day week month year when it comes to our finances and it's not that hard it's just you need a, a, a particular list of skills to be able to to do these things and and uh, and then do them again and again and again on repeat for the rest of your adult life. And so that's what this book is. Um, this book is an instruction manual for how to money. Um, I mean, we believe at Her Money that, that money is the tool that we all need to know how to use in order to get what we want out of life. It's not, it's not the be all and end all by itself. It's this important tool, um, but you know, you need some instruction on how to use it. What I appreciate so much about what you bring to the table and why I'm going to be informal with your bio and Catherine's bio is that of course, everyone uh, knows you, Jean, from your years on the Today Show, from your past books that I have mentioned, in addition to, of course, How to Money, but your partner in crime, Catherine Tuggle, is no slouch. Uh, you know, as the editor-in-chief of uh, Her Money Media, I am duly impressed when I heard you, Catherine, uh, at Barnes & Noble talking about the book, duly impressed. I am a huge listener, fan. I'm a fangirl of the Her Money podcast. And of course, Catherine, you are always on the podcast in the mailbag section, which I love. So in terms of your street head, Catherine, you came up with chapters with Jean, with the entire Her Money team, and there are chapters here of how to earn money, how to save money, how to smartly spend money. And I'm curious, from your vantage point, what is the most essential takeaway for young people who are navigating their finances? Is there one for you that bubbles to the top more than the others? Yeah, well, it's a great question because the reason we wrote the book 
in large part is because I think so many of us get financial advice coming at us from all angles. You talk to your mom, she's got her best piece. You talk to your dad, he's got his best piece. Uh, you know, aunts, uncles, everybody's going to tell you a few things when you're growing up about your money. Um, and I think it's hard to know like where they lie in the hierarchy of needs and, and how important each thing is. So I think that's why we, we started the book with, with the chapter on earn it. Um, about how to get money um, because you know before you know before you can save it and invest it you have to earn it um, and I think the part that that I wish I had had the most at that age is our section on uh, salary negotiation um, because we know that that starting salary particularly for young women who earn less than men over the course of their lives uh, that starting salary is so important you know, particularly a lot of us uh, are in jobs where the company will give you your raises based on a percent of your salary. So if you start, your starting salary has everything to do with what your salary is going to be in three years, in five years, in 10 years. Um, so, so putting that up front in the book uh, was really important to me, um, as was the chapter on budgeting. And, and spending smarter because I grew up, you know, in rural Alabama, uh, growing our own food, shopping at thrift stores, but not everybody has that upbringing. You know, that's, that's, I'm an outlier here in New York city for, for, for some of my experiences. So, um, you know, I would say the career stuff and then some of the, the down home truths about just doing all that you can to, to keep your spending low. One part of my reasoning for wanting to keep our scheduled conversation today is that in all of my research and reporting about grief and loss, there is a statistic that I instantly thought of when I first heard about what was unfolding in Texas. And it's because I was a former board member of the National Alliance for Children's Grief that I knew where to find the data but I'm gonna look down at my notes so I don't get it wrong. That an estimated 5.6 million children in the United States will experience the death of a parent or sibling by the time they are 18. And what that translates into according to the data, one in 13 children will then have lost a parent or sibling in the United States by the time they're 18. So when I heard the news of Texas and I heard the Sandy Hook parents coming out to talk to the media again, I was reflecting on their surviving siblings. And so because how to money is geared towards younger people, I thought of those kids who are vulnerable um, and what they do with their futures when the ground moves beneath their feet in the most horrific way when you lose a sibling. So what are the financial lessons? If you're, if you're thinking about mortality from such a young age and you're growing up with that on your mind, I would imagine there is a way to take that fear and make yourself better a better planner for your future, which includes love and relationships and your financial well being. So, my question, Jean, to you is how do you think teens and young adults who read How to Money, how can they prepare best if they're thinking about mortality, thinking about their parents? What can they do now as young people to be stronger? It's a, it's a um, boy, I mean, Allison, we could just unpack that question for the next hour and not move on to anything else because I think um, I think that that grief and loss and fear actually don't bring out the best in us as managers of our own money um, in, in a number of different ways. When, when we're thinking about um, about fear and about risk. If you've experienced a loss early in life, it can lead you to go in one of two directions, right? It can make you incredibly risk averse. 
Um, it can make you not want to take the risks that you have to take with your investments in the future. Um, or it can do the opposite. It can make you um, take all the risks. It can make you want to experience every bit of what life has to offer. And we're seeing a little bit of that right now with, with the younger people who have come through the pandemic. Um, there, there was a story in the Wall Street Journal just a, in the last couple of weeks about how um, Gen, Gen Z and, and some millennials have just said, we don't think that this world is for the long term. And so we are, we're going to spend, we're not going to save. And, and I think, you know, when we look at somebody who has experienced loss in, in, a, in such a profound way, um, the, the, the thing that you sort of have to do in order to capture your, your better self is to look at goals, to look at what do you really want? I mean, and, and that's the question for all of us when it comes to our money, no matter um, whether we've gone through a significant loss or not. But what, what, are, what are the big things on your list that you want in, in the short term, in the medium term, and in the long term? And how are you going to get there? Um, how, how are you going to plot your way there? Um, in, in a in a in an achievable manner. Um, beyond that, you know the 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 uh, the saving, the investing, the the actual machinations that that we all need to put ourselves through in order to be successful achieving those goals. You know that's largely just math. Um, but but it's it's taking a step back from the impulsive. Um, feelings that you have uh, at the turn at the time of a loss and and forcing yourself to really look at them and deal with them. I've often um, uh, been asked, you know, what do I do if I inherit? Um, what do I do if I if I get an inheritance? And my answer is always for the six month first six months to a year, you do nothing. Right. You do you do absolutely nothing because there's so many emotions tied up in that money that that you are likely to make decisions that you regret. Catherine, thank you, Jean. Catherine, when I was thinking about the recent events, of course, as someone who speaks grief all the time, I know that these events can trigger memories and reflections of our own losses. And so, and also the fear of the safety and security of those who we love most, those who are still here, but now we fear maybe something happening to them. So in that frame, Catherine, I'm curious for you, what questions do you feel are most important for the readers of How to Money to ask a surviving parent, a grandparent, about their finances? Are they taking care of their own store? How can they get involved and know kind of what's on the horizon in their own family? It's a great question. In the book, we, we, we frame a question around what do you want for future you? So we ask our readers to think about where they're gonna be in five years and 10 years. And we don't just give them the abstract concept of saving for retirement because our readers are, we know we're gonna be younger for this particular book. But we, we do talk about that your future isn't just some imaginary thing, it's you. You're going there, you're headed there. And in that way, I think it's, it's hopeful, um, but it's also helpful to make it seem like more of a reality that, that this is coming um, we know it's coming and we're going to try to get out ahead of it. So I, I hope that when people read our book, that maybe some more of those conversations like you're talking about will happen because these kids are going to be put into the frame of mind to think about their future selves. And I think it's a, it's an easy dovetail then to ask your parents about, well, what have you done for your future and how are you prepared for your future? 
And um, we also are, are trying to spark conversations around college and college savings um, between kids and their parents who, who are reading this book. And I think those college conversations, at least for me, those were the payment for college conversation is what opened up all the conversations that I had with my parents about money, because that was the first big expense that our family undertook as a group. I felt like we were on a team. We are playing for the same team here. We have the same goal here. Um, I was told very clearly by my father that your job is college. So you will show up to class every day because college is your job. Um, and I think, I, I think those conversations are perhaps easier to start when a child is 18 um, and they start to think about their first big investments. I agree. I have a child who just graduated college. And so these financial conversations are so important. And I know the team at Her Money had a, um, you know, a female audience in mind for this book. But to be honest, I came back from your book signing and I gave it to Jake <laughs> right away. And I, you know, it's such an inviting book to read. It's so colorful. The illustrations are so inviting that, I mean, he was tearing through it. His light was on. I saw him reading, you know, um, uh, in this kind of wonderful zone of after college and before he uh, moves from New York uh, down to Pennsylvania. So I appreciate how you're making it so accessible. Before I go ahead and ask Jean my next question, I do want to just take a housekeeping pause just to remind people of how the rest of the conversation is going to work so you can prepare. It is unusual to have Jean Chatsky in the house to answer your most pressing questions. It is unusual to have Catherine Tuggle available to answer your questions. So in the chat, please put your questions. What Christina will do during our, the course of our conversation when I go and ask, you know, Jean and Catherine some more uh, pressing questions that I have. I want you to put your questions in the chat. What Christina will do is then go through them all, decide which questions may be applicable to the most people on this call, and then you will get your questions answered by the best of the best. So we will do that. And even when this conversation is over at the strike of two Eastern time, if you come here every month, you know I am on time. The conversation does not have to end. Uh, Her Money Media is on Facebook at Her Money Media, Her Money Media on Instagram, Her Money Media on Twitter. I've already admitted, I've confessed my obsession with their podcast. So I definitely recommend that you uh, download that to your phone. I love those conversations conversations that Jean that you have all the time. Love them, love them, love them. So as I continue on my, my, my questions, please put your questions in the chat. Um, and then don't worry if we don't get to your question because at the strike of two Eastern time, if you want more, they are always available on social media. So don't worry about it. So Jean, here is my next question for you. What are the money losing mistakes? that teens and young adults too often make and how can we protect them from making them? I think they fall into a couple of, of broad categories. Um, number one is not paying enough attention to their money and number two is not paying enough attention to their time. Um, so let me let me sort of dig into into each of them. And and by the way, I don't think they're limited to teens. I think <laughs> these are mistakes that that people make all all along the way. And I know, for example, when I talk about not paying enough attention to their money, one of the programs that we have at Her Money is a is a coaching program. It's, it's finance fix and it's an eight week um, deep dive into your money to get you saving more, spending less and, and focused um, on heading in the right direction. And wait, hold on, Jean, um, can people buy that for their kids graduation gift? That seems like a fabulous gift idea. 
Yeah, no, they they absolutely can. We're, we're launching new classes every single month. And, and if you go um, to Her Money, you can uh, find the link for the Finance Fix program, or you can just go to financefix.com. It's, we spelled it with two X's because, you know, we were trying to get clever and, and, um, and and so it is. It is what it is. But it it's um yeah. I I think uh, we we have had some interest um in a in a program for young people particularly. So if we get enough, uh, we'll probably just fill a class with people that are that age. Um and and these are small group classes where people work together and work work one on one um with a coach. So but. I, I sort of started there because one of the big things that we do here is get people in touch with their money. Money goes so fast these days because it's so largely invisible, right? We just swipe and swipe and swipe and swipe and Venmo and, and tap. And, you know, I mean, you don't even have to, you just wave your phone and money gets spent. Um, and, and because of that, we don't know where our money is going. And when we don't know where our money is going and things are moving at a very, very quick velocity, thing, money slips through the cracks. Um, we have a lot of, of what professionals like to call leakage. And, and that gets really expensive, particularly for young people who don't have as much in the way of disposable um, income as, as their parents do and are used to living in their parents' um, homes where, where the spending is probably more um, lavish than they can afford on their own. And so you got to get your kids in touch with where their money's going. They have to pay attention. They can do it with an app. They can do it with a program like ours. They can do it with pencil and paper but they got to follow the money. Um, the second thing that they have to pay attention to is, uh, is, is time. And, and that comes in, in two different varieties. First of all, you know, time is money, right? I mean, you've heard that so many uh, times throughout your life, but once you have a sense of what an hour of your time is actually worth, it gives you a, um, a tool that you can use to make decisions about how you want to actually use that time. It's very, very powerful. And my quick hack for figuring out what an hour of your time is worth, which we put in the book, is just to take your salary, your annual salary, if you don't work by the hour, um, lop off the last two zeros and divide by two. And that is uh, essentially what your hourly rate happens to be. Um, but the other place that we get into trouble with time is by not considering the incredible value of our years when we're young. Um, if we can get ourselves investing in our 20s, that money has so much more time to grow than in our 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and is worth so much more down the line. So we don't want to waste these precious years as we're um, as, as we're, you know, trying to get our financial lives working well. Before I go to Catherine, are there, you mentioned some apps that help with the tracking of spending and are you comfortable suggesting a few that people can maybe jot down and uh, recommend to uh, those young people in their lives or even for themselves? Sure, hundred percent. Some are free, some are not free. So you wanna make sure that you know the difference. In, in the free bucket, Mint is quite good um, and, and probably the leader in the category, but, but there are others. If you wanna track with a spouse or with a partner, there's an app called Honey5. Um, if you are interested in an app that saves money for you, um, that uses artificial intelligence to look at your checking account and moves money out of checking and into savings when it determines that you have enough to save and you won't overdraw, um, that's called Digit. Um, it's not free. It's a couple of dollars a month, but I think it's worth it. Um, and then there's a very popular program called You Need a Budget or YNAB. Um, the Her Money community, despite the fact that it's not free, is, is a very big fan of YNAB. Thank you. That's really, really helpful. Um, Catherine, for those of us who have joined today's conversation, 
who perhaps are not joining us because they have a young adult in their life, but perhaps they have lost a spouse or perhaps they are anticipating the loss of a parent. I'm wondering what you think are the best planning um, ideas, opportunities to get your estate um, in order what should people take care of when they are anticipating loss? It, it's a great question. I mean, Jean actually could probably speak better to this just because she actually just went through it with her stepfather. And I know, Jean, that you mentioned there was a book that your mom used that, that they used together to sort of like lay out every everything that that their areas I'm, would I'm laughing because it wasn't a book it was something that my stepfather made up um but it, it you know by the so time it could be finished, a book by the time he was finished making it up it could have been a book um I think you know if you are so Allison are we talking about somebody who's preparing for the eventual loss or somebody yeah, who has in lost? Terms of, yeah in terms of planning for a loss what do you yeah. think is the really the most important thing to do as we plan as we anticipate um, document. Uh, and, and that means more than just having a, an estate plan. I look, I, I think everybody who has people in their lives or assets that they care about, um, take care about having some say over um, after they go needs an estate plan. Um, and that can be as simple as having a will a um, durable power of attorney for finance so that somebody can make financial decisions for you if you're not able to make them for yourself, a healthcare proxy so that somebody can make health-related decisions for you if you're not able to make them for yourself, and a living will that tells a, a doctor or a hospital whether or not you want life-sustaining measures, right? That, that in and of itself is a basic estate plan. It's not hard to get. It's not expensive. Um, you should have one and you should 100% have one if you're a parent because having a will is the only place um, where you can name guardians for minor children. So, um, so that's sort of table, table stakes. Beyond that, what my stepfather did and, and what I've done and my husband has done on his suggestion is, is putting together something that he called a letter of instruction and suggestion. Um, and it's basically just a roadmap. Here are the important people. These are the accounts. This is who you call. This is the, this is the financial ad advisor and the attorney and the accountant. These are the passwords or the key to the password manager. And you, you put this document together, you update it, um, you know, once every couple of years, and it can be a real lifesaver. I mean, my stepdad, um, whose name was Bob, and who, uh, you know, he he really laid it out. He he laid out everything from who will speak at his funeral to what sort of food he wanted ordered for the shiva. Which, if you're not Jewish, is that when 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 Jewish people die. Um, often there's there's a shiva and it is uh, a period of, of mourning where people often come to your house and and they eat and they drink and um, and my stepfather really knew what kind of food he wanted for the shiva and so that was you know he made it he made it easier for us and and when you're grieving whether it's this is the password to the Verizon account um, or this is what I want for my funeral, that helps. What strikes me about what you're saying, and I'm sorry about Bob. Thank you. Um, to me, what strikes me on a very personal level, my mother died a long time ago, right when I graduated college. And she was like a death denier. You know, She was not wanting to admit to herself um, that she was um, so sick. Um, and so it was the 11th hour when um, she was just not of a sound enough mind to write what you're describing. And I feel, I feel from what you're saying, it's an act of love what Bob did for his family. Don't you think? 
A hundred percent. Yeah, a hundred percent. Because, you know, for, for all the reasons I was saying before, we're not thinking clearly when somebody dies, right? And and any help that that you can give your loved ones because you've done some some pre-planning is I think really welcome. And by the way, it doesn't solve all the problems. I mean, it's it's gosh, it's it's been several months now and my mother is still going through, you know, and having to close accounts and and deal with tedious things that are, you know, truly annoying and and time consuming. Um, but she would have had so much more of that to do had he not put this roadmap in place for us. So yeah, I think it's a it's a hundred percent an act of love. It's incredibly kind um, to to do something like this for the for the people that you love. And by the way, if you don't do the basic estate planning, if you don't name the guardians, if you don't um, put the documents in place that give you the power to determine what happens to your children and your possessions, the state is going to make those calls for you. And they're not necessarily going to do what you wanted done, right? Um, and so uh, there's so many reasons why, why this is also a, a you know, it, it's an act of love, but it's also a real act of financial importance. Before I pivot to uh, the chat and Christina and our questions, I have to make a personal edit. It's not that my mother, I said it was a demonstration of love, which to me, when I heard myself say it, it made me think out loud that, huh, am I giving the impression that my mother uh, didn't love her family because she was a death denier? I don't think for her it was the case. I think some people, which is why I think this conversation is so important, uh, don't feel comfortable having it. Um, and so I wanted to give my mother a little bit of a pass uh, before I pivoted to Christina. So with that said, and my mother's memory intact, Christina, go ahead. I did just want to actually add the, the book yeah. that I was thinking of that I thought Bob had filled out, but perhaps he, he did his own thing. Um, is called I'm Dead, Now What? Which you might have oh. talked about on this show before, but it walks you through every single thing that your family might need. Your passwords, your attorney's name, you know, where your will is, if you have a safe deposit box. Um, and it, it's the kind of thing that you could fill out over time, over the course of a couple of years, um, whenever you had a minute um, to, to just jot some things down. So um, we, we've written about it before at hermoney.com and, and I've heard good things about it. Thank you so much. I'm sure Christina will add that um, to the chat in just a bit when she's done going through these questions, but uh, we're ready for you, Christina. Okay, the first question is anonymous. It says, I'm a new relatively young widow, completely unexpected, whose husband took care of finances while I raised our kids. My husband had a deep life insurance policy. How do I know who to trust when looking for a financial planner or wealth manager? Oh, I, I, I hear this all the time. Um, and first of all, I'm so sorry about your husband and, and for everybody in this, in this Zoom who's there because who's here because you've recently or not so recently experienced loss. Um, uh, you, you know, our, our hearts totally go out to you. Um, it, there's there's a couple of things. I mean, I think there's a level of basic trust, um, which you don't want some sort of a, a charlatan, right? You want to know that this person is licensed, that they are experienced. I like somebody with at least five years experience under their belts, um, that that they um, that they have not gotten into any trouble with the SEC, which is something. Or, or FINRA, as we call it nowadays, um, which is something that you can find out by going to FINRA.org um, and using what they call their broker check tool. Um, it will let you know if there are any red flags in this person's history. You should also just do a basic Google search. Um, make sure there's nothing out there that, that looks fishy to you. But then you want to make sure um, that you are finding somebody who um, who lines up with what you need from a financial planner, um, who is 
uh, economically feasible for you, um, where you understand the model of how they get paid and that that makes sense to you, um, and who is somebody that you can really talk to. And so I, I have a preference for comprehensive financial advisors. I, I like to see sometimes they're called holistic financial advisors. I, I don't want somebody who's just going to look at your brokerage accounts. I want somebody who's going to look at your whole financial life. Um, and I want them to be a fiduciary, which means that they are required to act in your own best interest um, rather than theirs. So if, if they are um, if they're sort of toggling between two very similar financial products, one of which costs more and would pay them a higher commission and one of which costs less and would, would benefit your pocket, they have to go with the latter. Um, all CFPs, certified financial planners, are fiduciaries. That's an important thing to know. So that's a good credential to look for. Um, you can... Um, go through a process where you ask friends and colleagues for recommendations to to build a short list of of planners and then you you want to sit down with them you know get three or four good recommendations sit down with them figure out how they get paid um are they working on a a, a a model where you're going to pay them a fee for their services or are they going to charge you a percentage of assets that they manage for you um, what is their sense of how your money should be invested and what other recommendations would they make for a person like you? And then, you know, pay very close attention uh, to who's doing the talking and who's doing the listening um, in this initial conversation. If, if somebody is talking at you and just telling you about all the good things that they can do for you, then they're not asking you enough questions about your life and your wishes. Um, and, and so I like to, I like, I like you to be doing most of the talking in this, in this initial meeting, if possible. Um, at hermoney.com, we also, um, we have a referral engine if you're looking for a certified financial advisor. Um, uh, so if you go to um, hermoney.com and you click our find an advisor button, um, we, we will uh, set you up with a consultation, a free one, of course, with a, with a certified um, financial planner and, and a fiduciary. Wow, that's a lot of really important information. Thank you so much, Christina. Let's keep there's, going. There's actually one more stop I wanted to share. Oh, there. yes, Kat. I keep cutting you off before. No, you're fine. Um, so there was a study that came out just a few years ago that two thirds of women, when their husband passes, they opt to find a new financial planner when they're widowed because, you know, the reasons are, are varied, right? Perhaps they feel talked down to, or, you know, perhaps they feel that the planner was always spoke to their husband and isn't addressing them directly. Um, but I think it speaks to the need to not stop until you find the perfect fit, because your financial planner is going to be someone that you check in with at least annually. And if you walk into that room and they're not making eye contact with you, or they are not making you feel fully heard and understood, you have to move on. I, I kind of equate it to finding a doctor. You know, you have to find a doctor who wants you to be your own advocate, who listens to you when you complain of pain. Um, and it's the exact same thing with a financial advisor. So like go, go to 12 if you have to, you know, um, it's, it's most important that you find the right fit. I love that advice, that sense of agency and taking control when you're reeling from loss is hard, but ultimately I think it's very healing because loss, as we know, makes us feel so out of control. So if you can regain a measure of that power, I feel like that in and of itself puts us on a path for us to feel uh, better uh, and on the path to feeling joy in the memory of our losses instead of just that, that pain. Um, so thank you, Catherine, for adding that. Christina, what else do you have? We have one attendee who lost her mother when she was 12 years old. Um, she's now an adult. She said she had extreme difficulty imagining her future self for at least a decade and realized absolutely nothing is certain, no matter what plans you make. So her question is, 
could you speak more to the intersection of uncertainty and financial literacy? Sure, do you wanna start, Catherine? Uh, yeah, I think for me, the thing that I see over and over again is that uncertainty leads to inaction. And we know that inaction is really the killer when it comes to investing and planning for the future. So many of us, I think the temptation is to say, you know, I'll save for retirement when I make more money or I'll get that estate plan, you know, once my kids are in school. Um, and we, we keep thinking that there'll be another better day to do it. Um, or we have so many questions, we don't know where to start. So we just decide, I'm just not gonna answer any of them because I know once I dive into the first question, it's gonna open up a whole can of worms. Um, so I, I think that that uncertainty can be paralyzing, which is why we always say to start with education um, because there are so many more resources out there, particularly for women than there ever used to be. Um, there are books, there are podcasts, there are websites, there are newsletters you can subscribe to that will walk you through the basics of everything, like like step by step how to open an IRA, step by step how to you know draw down on your four hundred one k to make it you know in the most advantageous way for you. Um, so I would just say start start with education um, first. Do you feel, Catherine, that education? Uh, is also great to get from your peers. I know the Her Money community has a Facebook group where people can talk and share, uh, you know, For Grief has a community page. So do you feel like that ability to commiserate, to learn, to rant, to be happy, to be sad, to share information back and forth as opposed to expert to learner, peer to peer, where do you see that support coming into play? I think you need both because I, you know, I think that we have all known friends who have good money advice, but we also kind of know they're not great with it either. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think you have to, you have to know your source. I, I love the fact that in communities like our Facebook group, women are bouncing ideas off of each other and showing support and giving solutions that might not have been considered before. So all that is amazing. But I do think at the end of the day, if you're going to create your official plan or your official strategy for your retirement and your long-term health and well-being financially, you have to have that fiduciary in your corner. Um, but I love the idea of getting a recommendation for that fiduciary from a good friend or talking about, you know, I, I think just knowing if you've made a mistake, just hearing that someone else has made that mistake can be so empowering um, and how they recovered from that mistake. So, so ideally women would have, would have both in their lives. And, and um, I approve people for the, for our Harmony Facebook group. So please request <laughs> and I'll put you right in. <laughs> That's good to know, Christina. Um, let's go with another question. We have some anonymous widows in the chat that want to know more about specific timelines. So one of the timeline questions is, um, is there a time that I should nail down a financial planner after becoming widowed? And the second one is, um, is there a guide for widows who need to close and retitle assets and accounts? By when does this need to be done? Um. I'll take it because I actually went through this process with my mom after my father died. So before she met and married my stepfather, um, uh, my mom was interesting in that I was raised by a woman who actually handled the money in the family, which was unusual for that um, for that generation. But uh, she was better at it than my father. She liked doing it more than my father. So she, she handled it for them, but they talked about everything. And when, um, my dad died, she felt like she lost her sounding board. Uh, and, and so we went through a process and I, I did it with her where we made a short list of financial advisors. And then we went and we interviewed them together. Um, and, this was probably about three to six months after my dad died. Um, it was in that window at some point. It was, it was, uh, it was past, 
she she was she was still in in a fog right she was still in in a fog but i think the importance of having somebody on your team during that time is that hopefully they they can um give you some guardrails um so that you are um not making um you know so that you don't make mistakes so that you don't make uh make decisions that you that you later regret um and and so i think sooner rather than later is probably a good thing to do as far as the specific retitling of assets and when that has to be done i honestly don't know off the top of my head and i don't want to give you um i don't want to give you wrong information um but i know that that your estate planning attorney will will know um and and uh and and likely your accountant will as well Catherine, can I ask you a question that we haven't gotten to yet? And maybe while I'm asking, if anyone has more questions, please throw them in the chat. But one thing that's on my mind, we talked about assets when a loved one dies and potential inheritances. And I think the advice that I heard was sit, wait, make an informed decision. Don't work on those assets. Don't think about them right away, that, that money. And the reverse, I guess, or the um, opposite would be debt, right? Like, what do you do um, with debt and bills and things that you are now perhaps having to navigate as a young adult? If you are a, a how-to money book reader, what would be the advice of navigating those very kind of choppy waters? Yeah, I mean, I would say just to it's twofold. I would say skip ahead to the things that you think are the most urgent. You know, if you know that there are pending debts that kind of supersede all else that, that are coming due, I would say definitely, you know, prioritize those. The, the reason for the advice for an inheritance to sit on it is in part what we were talking about with finding that good fit with a fiduciary, because not everybody has that financial planner that is trusted. Like, you know, if you're going to be like the two thirds of women who transition to a different financial planner when your husband passes, that's going to take time to find that fit. And before you make any moves with your money, you want to be doing it with a trusted advisor. But I think that there, there's a sliding scale of your to-do list. And, and certainly pending debts are going to be, are going to be the more urgent thing for, for you to take care of. Can I, can I just jump in for a second? Of course. Um, you know, if, if, if these are debts of, if, if you're the child, right, and these are debts of your parents or of your remaining parent, they are not your debts, right? They may be the debt of the estate um, and, and you are going to need to look at whether, whether the estate has the assets to satisfy them, but you don't have to personally satisfy them. So don't go, don't go, you know, necessarily um, down that road without getting, um, without getting your, your line straight. That's an important point. I don't think that would be obvious to perhaps most people. So again, going back to your very good point about getting that advice from a trusted, um, expert, I think is really important because unnecessarily you may think you have to take on those financial burdens and that could further make someone incredibly vulnerable in their financial health. Would you not agree? A hundred percent. Yeah, a hundred percent. And the laws and the rules are different, right? Across the board for different things. But, you know, there are many parents these days, there are many older people these days who, who have taken on student loan debt that they're carrying um, forever. For, for their kids and they're, they're carrying it into their, their 70s and their 80s. Well, student loan debt dies with the owner of that debt. And so, you know, you don't have to pick up those payments as, as the child, even if it was for your education. Um, but, uh, you know, a mortgage debt is going to have to be satisfied by the estate. And so, um, or you'll have to sell the house or you'll have to figure it out. So the, it, you got to go line by line and look at things specifically. 
I feel like I'm at the doctor's office and I'm learning so much about my health. In this case, it's my financial health. And I see that Catherine is responding to some questions in the chat. I feel like we're in a telehealth appointment where instead of talking about our, you know, fever and headaches, we're talking about we're getting a financial fix. Uh, we're getting a financial uh, checkup. So I really do appreciate that. Christine, I think we have time for like maybe a lightning round if you have a couple last questions. One question that came up from Hannah is, do you have any recommendations for easy and affordable online estate planning services or guidelines? Um, Legal Zoom is good and, and it's online and, and, it's, and it's affordable and it's understandable. Hmm, that's awesome. Christina, do you have any more or I have a couple more that we can do lightning round fast? Um, this one, a few people mentioned that they hired lawyers or financial planners that didn't have the family's best interest in mind. Are there questions that people can ask their financial planners to see, to like keep them on track or how should they handle um, the aftermath of a bad experience? I'm going to link our her money story on this topic because we actually have a list on our site of every question to ask a financial planner before you work with them so i'm going to put that in the chat oh i love it okay so my last question while catherine is putting that into the chat is for jean which is let's say you've inherited very very little money none at all you are a young person you're given this incredible book how to money where do they begin? What is the most important takeaway? If you're feeling that you are starting this financial journey, really kind of on your own, you're making your own path. Uh, this is a great way to begin. It's a great Bible. It's a great resource. But what's your number one tip to the young reader? Um, I'm going to tell your young reader the same thing that I have told my kids, which is save I told my kids, because they're a little older than kids who are just coming out today, but I told them save 10% of everything. Eventually you wanna get it to 15%. Um, and if you can do that from the time you start working until the time you retire, you're gonna be just fine. I love that. Well, in the last three minutes, I'm gonna do a roundup of where people can continue the conversation because I myself when I participate in zooms and I have more to say or we didn't get to your question in the chat you feel like you've been you know that you've signed up and you want to continue the conversation or maybe you think about something an hour from now or when you're going to sleep tonight or when you wake up tomorrow morning and you have a question uh, for Catherine and Jean uh, they're accessible I know they are um, I see their work and they have got your financial back so let me, I'm going to remind you where you can find them. So on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, it is Her Money Media. I know Christina has their personal social accounts that she can put in the chat as well. Do not forget about their podcast. I love it. I'll be listening right along with you. And of course, you know, reimagine our friends, Andy. Thank you so much for always having us. And reimagine is on Instagram at Let's Reimagine on Twitter. Let's underscore reimagine. Don't forget the underscore. And on Facebook, it's Reimagine End of Life. And at the top of our show today, we talked about the transition that is underway from Domani for grief to for grief. That is underway. It is exciting. Please do check out the social media that we have going on. Check out the new website. It is growing. It is going to get better and better. So join us. The conversation is not over and again, I was so honored to come to your book launch party, Catherine and Jean, and best of luck with How To Money. I'm so honored to have, have spent this hour with you guys. Thank you, Allison. Thanks so much for having us. Guys, it's been great. All right, bye you guys. See you next month. <laughs>